glad that they let him go. I, I guess I'm, I'm just glad because we'd have problems out in Los Angeles had they, you know, had they kept him. I'm sure they would have uh, gotten, a little, gotten a little crazy out there. My brother Jack, who is an attorney uh, in Pittsburgh, um, said that he has no idea what uh, beyond a reasonable doubt means. And when I said, what do you think of the jury system? He says, you should see the judges. They're worse. I'd rather put my, hand, my, my faith in the hands of a jury. The judges can be wackos. Uh, James, is, is, do you know what beyond a reasonable doubt means? Um, it, it's a concept that ha that's difficult to really specify and articulate. And I'm impressed with juries who, who really try to grapple with it. But I think it really means what it says. If you have a doubt about the case, about the guilt, and is that doubt reasonable? Anything is possible. Martians could have come down and put the glove there. I mean, but is that reasonable? No, because we, by and large, don't believe in that kind of stuff. And, Carl, and, I, and I think the way that the jurors were told to think about reasonable doubt uh, was that it's not, you know, uh, any possible doubt in the world. And what these jurors talked about in, in their debriefing with the press is they talked about why wasn't there more blood. Well, the point is, what was the, the impact and the evidentiary value of the blood that was there. I mean, you know, they w wanted the prosecution to explain every single question regarding this homicide, and short of a videotape, it seems to me these jurors are saying that they wouldn't have convicted O.J. Simpson. And the last thing I want to say is that what is really uh, the ha most haunting part of the closing arguments, as far as I was concerned, was when Marcia Clark and Chris Darden talked about uh, the p pathway left by Nicole Simpson, the safety deposit box. How many people do you know that are 30 years old that execute a will and leave that kind of evidence? And how Nicole was in the wrong place for a long time, and she knew she was going to be killed. And, and, and Marcia Clark asked these jurors, can you hear her now? Are you going to do anything? She had such a sense of resignation in her voice. I mean, I can't understand how having listened to that, having seen the evidence, having seen this blood trail, you could come up and say, well, domestic violence is a trial for another day. It's another issue. This is a murder case. I think that's very important. And obviously the jurors listened to Nicole's voice from the grave, but I wonder if they really heard it. Instead, they heard the defense line, the defense message. They bought it, and in fact, one of the jurors yesterday repeated it, uh, talking about the little slogan, uh, the little jingle offered by the defense involving the glove. I'd like to share with you that what Alan Dershowitz's philosophy is, as uh, demonstrated in a 1982 statement that I find very illuminating. Dershowitz, of course, a member of Mr. Simpson's defense team, said in 1982, the defendant wants to hide the truth because he's generally guilty. The defense attorney's job is to make sure the jury does not arrive at that truth. And that's a quote from one of his books. You know, uh, one, I don't, and here's a quote from O.J. Simpson. The, the prosecution and the legal commentators uh, distorted evidence to make me look bad. But, you know, by, oh, by, by, the, by the actual facts and the records, O.J. placed a call uh, from his cell phone, I assume in the Bronco. If you're in the house, you'd use your phone in the house. So he's in the Bronco. It, at 10.02, and he's placing a call then, and then, and then when Alan Park uh, comes up, he says, I was, uh, I, I was sleeping, I was in the shower, right around the time that he was actually in the car by his own admission. That's not a distortion. Those are quotes from O.J. Simpson. That's my problem. That's why I think he's guilty. And the, the, but the thing is, and, and we all understand this, what the jurors had to actually say wasn't necessarily what was happening. What happened there was these jurors adopted an agenda. They decided to, perhaps because of Mark Furman, perhaps because they um, cared about or liked uh, O.J. Simpson so much, I think least of all because of what Johnny Cochran actually had to say, uh, they adopted an agenda that we call in the legal profession jury nullification. They decided that it was more important to send the message that Johnny Cochran argued for uh, to uh, LAPD uh, that um, they didn't like uh, this business of racism 
and the abuses that they perceive that cops have perpetrated on individuals in Los you, Angeles. You know what's well, ironic? It was more profound sorry, than that. It was more corrupt than that. Uh, uh, excuse me. I think it was more profound than that. It was more corrupt than that. I think uh, James is a nice man, and I think he's used nice words in an appalling situation that requires stronger adjectives. So let me just use those adjectives. I mean, these jurors, I mean, this is they had an absolute legal obligation to deliberate. Anybody who gets in a room with 12 people and talks for three hours and they come to a decision, they didn't even want to examine the witnesses, the evidence, the testimony, the, the uh, exhibits. I mean, you know, what is so appalling here is that they arrived at the decision before they got into the jury deliberations box. Yes, I mean, I agree. you know, for them, to, and they didn't want to be disturbed by raising questions. They okay. wanted just a little snippet of this instead of having uh, to deal with and resolve the hard evidentiary questions posed by this case. Right. This they had an agenda when they went into the that. System. Yes, they had an agenda when they went into that into that uh, deliberation room, and they indeed did not deliberate. They simply carried out what their intended purpose was. You, you know, and you what happened keep, to the two no votes? Why did they? What happened to those two no votes? They got overpowered. Ten to two. They got overpowered. Well, and you know what happens all the time. In three Absolutely. Hours. I have had overpowered in three hours. That's, it's easy to do. I've had one juror overpower eleven other jurors in a case like that. I had a case where a gentleman who I stupidly it was my fault left on the jury who had had a bad experience with police officers. I didn't realize at the time it happened to be police officers in my case, but it was too late. Once he was on the juror, he turned everybody around. It can be done. I've seen it done, and certainly ten to two is a lot easier to do than one to eleven. <laughs> bother putting up a fight. They didn't even hold out for a long period of time. I mean, you know, you hold sure. out when after days you cave. Sure. Or after weeks you cave. Sure. After three hours, they didn't fight for their position. That's Here's right. And I think the time, I think the time of this is... to me is we don't really know, of course, because all of the jurors have not been debriefed. We may have to wait for their future books or movies to find <laughs> out what they were really thinking. And I'm not even sure if we will find out whether all of them will be totally candid I think or that's not really the point. I don't really think we're going to be able to trust what they'll have saying. some sort of face-saving type of uh, front that they, some of them may put up. I don't know. But, but the problem is, uh, did they thoroughly review the evidence and the question, and it, appear, and it seems to me that they could not have in the few hours Absolutely. that they have reviewed the over a thousand pieces of evidence, the, uh, more, the testimony of more than a hundred witnesses. And that is what is so disturbing because I think there is an obligation to the murder victims, to the murder victims' families, to our system of justice, to really come up with a very, very careful and deliberate kind of verdict on such a very important case. And sure. making a political sure. decision doesn't cut it. And that's clearly what was made here, is sure. a political decision. Well, I'm and not saying it was decided. right, I'm just saying that that's what happened. I'm not no, saying it's I'm right or justifying I'm, I'm just, just expressing that... my frustration. I understand. And, and what, what appears to be here, it was the case is, is that I've decided, Charles, that all life is, you know, it's just about tit for tat. It's all about scorecards, paying off, uh, uh, payback time, it's all racial politics, and there is no uh, really reason for anyone, good people here, to determine what actually happened and whether a murderer was released. I mean, it just is uh, very disheartening. Well, that's yeah. my point. And when you think about who benefits and who is hurt by this kind of racial politics, if in fact that's what was going on in the jurors' mind, we really have to really think about that because in the future, in other cases, are we saying that if there is racism in the system that people, that, that criminals can go out and kill and maim and rape and rob as long as there are racist officers in the system? Are we saying that they can get away with it and bear no consequences for their acts? But I don't think you are can really separate... Will be unprotected? I don't think you can separate those issues from the fact of who was on trial here. If it had been me, if it had been even maybe somebody as, as famous as Charles Grodin on trial, the result probably would have been different. Because of you had who you had on trial, I think that, that in conjunction with those things that you're talking about made yep. a tremendous amount of difference. You're right. Money, celebrity, uh, and celebrity status, more than uh, money. Were I think. factors definitely were factors in this case. But if yeah. you logically follow out the thought.
that and accept the premise that there is racism and sexism in the system, the whole system nobody can collapse. deny there That's is right. racism and sexism in the system, then we might as well shut the courthouse door tomorrow and say, we can't prosecute anybody right. at all, and so just let the criminals run wild. I don't accept that. I accept the fact that there is racism and sexism, but clean it out, but still have our system of justice because we don't have anything else to rely right, on. Right, but let's not we be too much of doomsayers, though, because we know that the system does work most of the time. We have a 95% conviction rate in my office. We know it does work most of the time. This was an aberration. We got to keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. We, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you, uh, Gloria and Melanie and James. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll be back talking about this as long as it's out there, and I appreciate your, your feelings, your frustration, your comments, and your insights, and we'll go to a break. We'll be back with uh, the journalist Dominic Dunn from Los Angeles and Jonathan Alder from Newsweek, and we'll be right back. Time management entails prioritizing, synergizing, so reorganizing, Earth right to business sizing, guru, this is difficult. Well, at least Office Max, the office product superstore, is easy. Over 6,000 office products, including quality brand names like O'Sullivan or Digital. A guaranteed low price that won't make that vein on your accountant's forehead bone. <laughs> Free delivery, too. Talk about time management. Office Max, we go to the max for you. Discover the first in a unique class of pain reliever, Zostrix. Even though prescriptions have never been required, doctors prescribe the Zostrix brand more than all other topical arthritis pain relievers combined. Zostrix, physician strength relief is in your hands. It's Celebration, the hottest collection of dance hits ever. Celebration over one full hour of hot dance hits for only $9.99 on compact disc or cassette. Then audition other great sounds of the 70s album. There's no minimum to buy. Cancel anytime. Celebration is not sold in stores, so call right now and get physical. To order, call 1-800-615-1919 or send just $9.99 for one cassette or one CD plus $3.50 shipping and handling to the address on your screen. Now get 24 issues of the new New Yorker week after week for just $19.98. Save $40 off the cover price and get the special cartoon collection free with your paid subscription. Call 1-800-851-1400. Next week, all the stars come out on Charles Grodin. Monday, a journalist roundtable discusses the impact of the Simpson decision. Tuesday, former Governor Mario Cuomo and comic Drew Carey. And Wednesday, Ernest Borgnine and singer Mel Tomei. It all happens next week on Charles Grodin. Monday on Squawk Box. John Goodfriend will join us to give us his insights into the markets, and we will talk to the CEO of the Sports Authority. Find out how his business and his stock are doing. Monday on CNBC Squawk Box. Limousine service provided by Music Express, voted number one by the National Limousine Association, with offices in Los Angeles and in the New York area. Call Music Express to handle your corporate limo needs anywhere in the U.S. and the world. We're joined uh, from Los Angeles, a novelist, journalist, and special correspondent for Vanity Fair magazine, Dominic Dunn, and... In our New York studio, Jonathan Alter, the senior editor for Newsweek magazine. Uh, Dominic. Um, Hi, Charles. How are you? Okay. Uh, any, any comments about anything? I know you have a lot to say. Well, you know, I can only tell you this. I was stunned, utterly, totally, completely stunned uh, when the verdict came in. I, you know, I had always thought it was going to be a hung jury, and then we heard there was a verdict. And, you know, for the night before, I truly thought he was going to be convicted. And uh, I just cannot remember a moment uh, that has ever affected me quite as much. You know, I've become very, very close to the Goldman family. I am devoted to the Goldmans. And I think Fred Goldman is a, is a superb human being. And I have found Kim Goldman to be the conscience of this uh, a trial. I am heartbroken for them. 
Yeah, do you, you think the reason you're so hurt is that your, your, your belief in justice has been so assaulted? Is that it? Well, absolutely, Charles. Now, look, I mean, I think what this jury did is give the middle finger to justice. Absolutely. I mean, it was this. It was that the fact that they chose not to deliberate is so, I mean, deliver three hours after nine months, it, it's so shocking to me, so completely shocking to me, and that the two holdouts, I heard Melanie just say this, but I mean, I feel just as strongly as she does, that they were so weak and so weak-willed that they didn't argue for a full day to, uh, 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 for what they believed, and, that, and the, the, the child of that uh, uh, particular juror, number three, had said that her mother believed O.J. is guilty. I am stunned by her. Uh, Dominic, I is this a... All the way through. Is this a yeah, failure sorry, of the jurors or a failure of the system? Well, I don't know. It's a failure. It's a failure. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there were a lot of things. I think probably the heroine for the uh, uh, defense in this is Joe Ellen Demetrius, who put that jury together. I mean, it's the uh, juror of uh, consultant. I mean, the fact that there was a juror on it who was a former Black Panther and, and gave the salute on the, on the way out, I mean, that the prosecution didn't know this. I mean, this is just extraordinary to me. Yeah, it's a, uh, Jonathan, you want to jump in before yeah, we go I, to the break? We have a minute. I just wanted to ask Nick Dunn quickly, why hi, did Jonathan. the prosecution, hi, why did the prosecution let that kind of jury uh, uh, go forward. Uh, they, they had to know that this was not going to be uh, an especially friendly jury. What happened there well, during voir dire? Well, I mean, apparently they made a very wrong call on thinking that domestic violence was going to be a more important issue than what it was. It is my understanding that Martha, uh, that Marsha Clark thought that the African American women on the jury would be moved uh, uh, and influenced by the domestic violence, but obviously that just didn't work at and all. There was a lot of research that should have told her that. I understand she didn't listen to some of the jury consultants who were. We're, gonna, we're coming up to a break, fellas. Uh, we'll, we'll go to a break and then we'll be uh, right back and uh, discuss uh, the character of O.J. Simpson. We'll be right back. This is CNBC. of the Pharaoh Ramses the Great. In a lifelong quest for immortality, this is his final ceremony. For 70 days, his body has been cleansed, purified, and dried. Preservation of the body, the key to immortality. If his mummy remains intact, and if his name is remembered, then Ramses will never die. Call now to order Egypt. In future Lost Civilizations videos, you'll solve the mystery of the real Atlantis. Discover the precise location of the Garden of Eden. And find out the exact date for the end of life as we know it. Call now to journey to Lost Civilizations whenever you want. See Egypt, quest for immortality, and unravel the mysteries that keep the dead alive for just $4.99. You can be the first to own the story of young Pocahontas on video at the special pre-release price of $19.95 through this exclusive TV offer. Everything looks beautiful in my world. Waterfall. This animated look at young Pocahontas will enrich your children's enjoyment of her amazing story. We should always be afraid of things that are different. But you're different, and we're not afraid of you. I'll fix that. They'll learn teamwork as Pocahontas and her animal friends join against the medicine man's evil scheme. It's showtime. It's a full hour of entertainment for $19.95. And we'll even include this sing-along cassette and the talking storybook free. That's a $30 value. And if you call right now, we'll also include a $5 rebate coupon. That's right. This entire $30 value is yours for just $14.95 with rebate. It's
summer's worth of entertainment to your kids. Call now. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in the character of O.J. Simpson. I was particularly struck when I read his book, uh, how he, when he was lying on the back of the Bronco the first time he was taken home in a white van, and he was listening to Dan Rather report on the radio that there were nine uh, 911 calls from his house over the years, nine reports of spousal abuse. And his response to that at that moment was, nine, that was like a knife through my heart. It was a piercing through my heart. Uh, words to that effect, because it was only eight. You know, I, I, I don't understand that character. Who is that? Who, who, in, in other words, here's a man who really believes and sees things the way he believes and sees things. I think, you know, I, I too have feeling for O.J. Simpson. I too find him an appealing character. I think there's something wrong with O.J. Simpson. I mean, imagine, Dominic, that you have had uh, eight uh, calls from your home of abusing your spouse, God forbid, and, and there, it's reported as nine, and all you focus on is that there were nine, not eight. Isn't it odd? Well, let me just tell you something else right up to the minute here, just about this uh, very thing. On uh, Larry King last night, when uh, Johnny Cochran uh, was on, and of course O.J. Uh, uh, phoned in, and so forth, Johnny Cochran said, O.J. is mad. He is mad. And, and um, you know, later I talked to someone very, very close who had been in the house and Rockingham ever since, and I said, what is O.J. mad about? He should be on his knees thanking God that he has gotten away with this. And he said he is, the report, the reply was to me, he is livid with Gil Garcetti, who is the district attorney, as we all know, of uh, Los Angeles. He is livid with Gil Garcetti because Gil Garcetti said in a statement that the case is closed and they are not going to look for the killers. Now give me a break. Well, this is a give man Give me clear. a break. This is a man clearly uh, in denial. And I should add, Charles, a man who we're going to have to now call controversial, the controversial <laughs> O.J. Simpson. We can no longer call him a murderer because presumably we'll get a letter from one of his uh, attorneys threatening us with libel if we, if we do so. But one of the small punishments that uh, he will now suffer, and it's comparatively small to what he, he should be uh, going through, is that O.J. Simpson always wanted to live in a white world. And as Ron Shipp said on the stand, he tended to, t to treat other blacks as help a lot of the time. Uh, now, uh, at least for the short term, before his uh, rehabilitation has been completed, his public rehabilitation, um, he will live in a black world where he, where he will be cheered and the white world will shun him. Uh, will he be shunned? Temporarily. Right. Well, Dominic and Jonathan, you know, this response to Gil Garcetti, it, it leads you to believe that O.J. Simpson honestly believes and knows that he did not do this and someone else did. Doesn't that suggest Or that it's the greatest con job of all time, which is what I think. Or it's something else. Or it's some, somebody who maybe is not, doesn't have the same relationship with reality that other people do. And there are a lot of people walking around who don't, who appear with suits and ties and look like everybody else, but don't have the same relationship with reality. And given what I know about O.J. Simpson, uh, I tend to, to, to believe that, that there's a part of him that knows the truth, but most of him says, how dare they not look for the real killers? I think it was an aberrational, you know, I never really got an answer. Was there, were, were, was the blood tested for drugs? I mean, you, you never really got an answer. How would it not be? Is it possible that the blood was not tested for drugs? Is that conceivable? I know neither yeah, of you are you. lawyers, but. It's interesting he's so concerned about the real killers now, but in the 24, 48 hours after the murder, he, he didn't show much Never uh, gave him a thought. concern about it. The, the other thing that strikes me is, is Johnny Cochran. And, I, you know, my, my whole, uh, you know, I, I'm really compelled in these, in these broadcasts since the verdict. I know these aren't broadcasts. I don't know what they are. When you're on cable, it's not a broadcast, but I don't know what it is. So whatever the heck this is, <laughs> we're on. Uh, uh, you know, and I, don't, and I, I want to be conciliatory, and I don't want to be inflammatory, but when, when Johnny Cochran gets up and he quotes the book of Luke, and if you tell a small lie, you know, it suggests that you're capable of telling a large lie. Uh, does anybody believe that O.J. Simpson didn't take the stand because he thought the jury was tired? Does anybody believe that... Not that, me. That, well, that, even not Johnny me. Cochran, uh, under questioning from Cynthia McFadden, you know, when she said, that's like a dog ate my lunch dog ate my homework kind of response. He admitted that there were other reasons, but that was an example of the kind uh, of line of bull that we heard a lot uh, 
during the trial. Now, does anybody uh, really believe, as Johnny Cochran looked you right in the eye, and I think uh, another attorney for them did as well, uh, and say, you know, this could very easily have been a, they, these people could have been after Ron Goldman at Nicole Simpson's house. Does anybody really believe, that, that's my problem. And, you know, to, to put it simply, I'm not a juror, but if I was a juror, I'd be asking those questions. They evidently didn't ask those questions. They didn't ask the questions with all the empathy that you might feel for what essentially with <laughs> O.J. Simpson, who can appear to be an appealing nice man. Why does he have three versions of where he was in that key hour and 20 minutes? Why? If Jonathan Alder had three versions, I'd say you did it. He was know. sleeping and hitting golf balls at the same time. And driving time. around and, and his van. I mean, why is that not compelling uh, evidence? At the same uh, time that uh, uh, Colombian drug dealers were over killing Nicole because they thought she was Faye Resnick. That was his search for truth, Mr. Cochran. Well, that, that's the problem. And when I was talking about the jurors last night, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe it, it, it's appropriate to say from this jury pool, that is what you're going to get. And maybe it's appropriate to say if you sequester people for nine months, you're not going to get people that are going to want to sit and reason and, and Well, logic. I don't know. You, I'm not sure you can draw that conclusion. You know, uh, it's very hard to know what happens inside uh, a jury room. And it, so much of what we've heard in the last... A uh, couple of days has just been the rankest kind of uh, speculation. You know, they bond together in certain ways. People, uh, if they do err, they do tend to want to err on the side of uh, of letting somebody out rather than convicting them. And I totally disagree with their decision. But in the same way that I want, I wanted the rule of law in the resolution of the case. Part of the rule of law is to say that. You know, we have to abide by their decision. I don't want the Justice Department investigating it. I hated the Simi Valley decision in the Rodney King case, but I don't want the Justice Worse. Department retrying that either. We've so we've got to abide by it. We've come to the end of this, and we will abide by it. Jonathan, thank you. Dominic, uh, thank you. And uh, to my earlier guests, uh, James Curtis, Melanie, Melanie Lomax, and Gloria Allred. And for the people who think uh, if the gloves don't fit, uh, you must have quit. Get a pair of gloves that fit and then put on some latex gloves underneath them and try them on. I did it on the air. The gloves don't fit if you have latex on, even if they fit without the latex. Stay tuned for Real Personal with Bob Berkowitz. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Good night, everybody. Good night, Mom. I love you.